Uh, on behalf of uh, the team at Brains Trust, uh, my colleagues from the British High Commission uh, and friends, and uh, our team at the Peninsula Studios, uh, we really thank all of you for having made the time to be here with us this evening. Uh, it means a lot to us. Uh, I shall be brief, but I must start by thanking the leadership team of Bangalore International Center, uh, Ravi and his colleagues. Uh, you wouldn't believe it, but I think this whole program has been done over two or three WhatsApp messages and one or two emails, which just goes to show what a wonderful team it is. Uh, I really wish at some point in time we could reciprocate when you come up to Delhi. I also need to thank a friend of mine who's sitting somewhere in the audience, and uh, he's an old friend of mine, and uh, he is singularly responsible for ensuring we inflict ourselves on you, Sriram Srinivasan. Uh, Sriram, without him, I don't think we would have been here. Uh, so my name is uh, Shubroto, as, uh, and I work for the Peninsula Studios. So 10 years back when we started this journey uh, with very, very little resources, which continues to be the situation. We don't mind it. Uh, we discovered, when we were doing music, we discovered the great poetry. And we were exploring the fringes of our ignorance. We discovered the beautiful poetry of Maharaj Swati Tirunal, the Maharaj of Travancore in 1830s, the trinity of Karnataka music, 18th century, uh, Vallabhacharya, Purandara Dasa, Subramanya Bharati, the great poets of Punjab, Shah Hussain, Bulle Shah, Baba Farid, uh, Lalon Fokir from Bangladesh, all the bhakti poets. It just kind of uh, was so fascinating. But what was more important is when we started producing this music, we found that people who didn't understand the language got into it and tried to understand. So we feel that there is a huge space available for good quality content. And five years back, we started uh, Brains Trust. And we had a stellar lineup, as you can see. And to give you an idea, we had Ambassador Satinder Lamba, who was our High Commissioner to Pakistan. And I believe he was the person who opened the mission in Dhaka after the liberation of Bangladesh in 1971. He has written a monograph on the Durand line, which runs between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, once we recorded him and we put the maps and pictures and so on and so forth, we got a fantastic response even from the other side of the border. And because it was, you know, it was no rhetoric, it was not biased, it was just the way things had happened. And so with our friends in the British High Commission, over the last five years, we got a stellar cast of speakers who speak on a variety of subjects. This gentleman is, uh, has, a, has, a, has a designation which is in the news now. This is Chief of Defense Staff of UK, General Nicholas Carter. And he spoke for about 40 minutes on leading in a digital world. And he speaks about how difficult it is to manage when you have got Facebook, Twitter, people taking pictures on their phones and you know, WhatsApping it and going viral. So the challenges which you face uh, in a digital world as a leader is what he speaks about. It's a very insightful talk. And we recorded him, and he was not in uniform. So if you didn't know who he was, you would think that he's a leader of a very large global commercial organization, the leader of a large global organization. Outstanding. This year, we plan to record close to 45 speakers for the lineup over the next uh, 36 months. And this is Dr. Manushi Lahiri. She has written a fa fabulous book called Ma Mapping India. And this is about the world of theodolites, the great trigonometrical survey, how it went south to north, west to east, and how was India mapped, the survey of India, which later Muli is going to, Vinesh Lobra is going to talk about. Uh, this year, this, uh, today we've got three outstanding speakers. At number three is a person who represents the finest uh, amongst military leadership, Major General Ian Cardozo. He fought the 65 and the 71 wars. He's a war hero. And we have a small video as a tribute to him, which we'll play. So you will discover for yourself what he and many other people who are in, the, in uniform, what they do, and what kind of challenges they face. At number two is Colonel Ajay Shukla. Ajay, like General Cardozo, is a graduate of the National Defense Academy and the Indian Military Academy. Uh, Ajay also went to school in Lawrence School, Sanar. And uh, he got accepted by one of India's prestigious Armored Corps regiments, which is uh, Hudson's Horse, which is otherwise known as Four Horse. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, 
uh, in the commercial world, in the private world, uh, getting a promotion in the military is very difficult. It's a very steep pyramid, and the holy grail of any officer getting commissioned is first to command his battalion at the end of, say, 17 to 18 years. Ajay commanded uh, Hudson's, and then he did something unusual. He took retirement from uh, the Indian Army, and he uh, chose to pursue academics. He went to King's College in London, became a journalist, a writer, an author, and a defense analyst. And he also did something else. He went and spent about a year with a very small child and a young family in Arunachal to find out what the border between India and China was like when you were there. So Ajay will tell that story. Uh, opening the batting is a very dear friend of mine, Vineshi Lobroy. If you were to tell people that you heard Vineshi Lobroy, chances are people will say Vineshi Lobroy. But if you said Muli was here, then lots of people would know Muli. So Muli. Uh, again, went to Dune School, and then he was in St. Stephen's. He went to, he, he did his master's in economics from Delhi School. He got accepted by the Indian Administrative Service, and there are two loves of his life. One, of course, is Nans, and the second is having joined the Assam and Meghalaya cadre of the IS. His love is the Brahmaputra Valley, the hills of Meghalaya, Arunachal, Tripura, Mizoram, Manipur. He spent a lifetime there. If I make spelling mistakes when I'm talking, it's because of him. He taught me English for a year. Uh, but about 30 years back, I had gone off from Hyderabad, and he was posted in Delhi. And he, like he always does, he said, are you aware of the fact that there is a mountain on the Tibetan plateau, which is called Mount Kailash? And there are three rivers which flow out from that uh, river, uh, from that mountain. Uh, one is the Indus, which the Vedas refer to as the Sindhu. The second is the Satlij. And the third, of course, is the story which he's going to tell. So the Indus, as you well know, it flows west. And it, many of you would have seen it in Leh meeting up with the Zanskar. It goes to Skardu, swings south. 17 tributaries, including the Kabul River and all the five rivers of Punjab, goes through fascinating cities like Larkana, Hyderabad, Sindh. And then it goes into the Arabian Sea east of Karachi. Uh, I used to go to Iran quite often on work, and every conversation would end up where the Persians would say, Kishwaroto, do you know, we have a river on the east of Iran, which you call Sindhu, we can't pronounce it, so we call it Hindu, and therefore the river Indus. And the lands on the east of the river Indus is Hindustan, and the people on the east of the river Indus are Hindus. Uh, the second river is the Satlij. The Satlij comes into Himachal, comes down, I've seen it in Ludhiana, but Satlej also is a story of a train. Now, this train used to leave from Bombay in Ballot Pier and travel 2,600 kilometers from Bombay to Delhi, from Delhi to Firozpur. At Firozpur, it would cross the Satlej, and then it would go to Kasur, Lahore, Peshawar, and from there, 56 kilometers on to Lundi Court, which is the last railhead, because the garrison towns had to be fed and armed and resourced. Now, I have been to Firozpur, and uh, it's a fascinating place. When you cross uh, the Firozpur, uh, from Firozpur, when you cross the Satlej, this is what you see. It is the memorial to Shaheed Bhagat Singh, Rajguru, Sukhdev, and Batukeshwar Dutt. You can see that here. And it's a beautiful memorial. And uh, this is the, you think this is a fort. It is not a fort, the, the picture on the right. It is actually a railway station called Husseiniwala. And the pockmarks that you see there are, is the shelling it received, because just across it is the road which goes to Kasur. And in 1965, the Pakistani is attacked it with tanks. And uh, there's a second battalion of the Maratha Light Infantry called Kali Panchvis. They stopped them. They took huge casualties. They lost their commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Nolan. And, but they protected. They didn't allow the Pakistani to cross the river and come into Firozpur. Otherwise, Firozpur had fallen. And they got the battle honors for the 65 war, which is called Husseiniwala. The other thing which you see is the railway line. The army maintains this. And it just shows that it stops there. It's just a legacy of a partition. Uh, because I, I don't know what the railway line looks like from the Pakistan side, but this is where it stops. But uh, the story which Muli told me, and he's going to tell you today, is about a river which many of us who have been posted in Assam in our careers, is, uh, comes in as a trickle uh, from no one knew where, and becomes the, joins up as a, becomes the Siang, the Lohit, becomes the Brahmaputra, joins up with the Ganga in Bangladesh, and goes into the Bay of Bengal as uh, Meghna, 
But what Muli told me is 150 years back, nobody knew where this river came from or what was on the other side of the Himalayas. And that is the story of the survey of India, the pundits, and it's a fascinating story which uh, he will tell you. Vineshi Lovroy. Thank you, Shubrotu. Good evening, everybody. It's always nice to speak after Shubroto speaks about you because he says nice things about you. So, but he's right, the surveyor pundits, the river, and of course central to them, the Himalayas. That's what I'm going to speak about this evening. The beginnings of my interest in the Himalayas actually began in my school, which was in the foothills, and um, Assorted expeditions, minor ones, the school was fairly well um, known for its trekking and for its staff, its faculty, who had done things that we thought were extraordinary and looking back, I think they were very extraordinary. But um, the school was a stone's throw away from, well, actually not a stone, maybe a couple of stones throws away from the Survey of India, which I'd like to tell you about it, um, the survey. And this is also a story of a few good, intrepid, innovative, observant men who went out, were sent out into Tibet to map what had not been mapped before. The maps then had big blank spaces. It's the Europeans who brought cadastral mapping and survey as we know it today. If you look back on earlier maps, they were good, they showed direction, they had a sense of scale, but they were not cadastrally mapped. So let me begin with the Himalayas, and the Himalayas as we know are a fairly recent formation. Um, a breakaway from the mother continent of Gondwana land, not very long ago, only 150 million years ago. And it broke off and began its journey northward, a continuing journey where, of course, it collided with the landmass of Asia. And even now, the Himalayas are pushing upward, outward, and in fact, pushing northward at um, some kind of geological gallop um, of a couple of inches um, every year. And the Himalayas are pivotal to this story because the rivers that Shubroto spoke of and the rivers that you see, most of them predate the Himalayas. So they cut through or they swing around, but the Himalayan river systems and that's where most of the water comes from because the big catchments are here. They are different. So I, I'm going to really talk about, and he spoke about that. Within 100, in fact, 210 kilometers of each other, these three major rivers, the Indus, which um, is the name that our country gets its name from, the Sutlej, there are others, and what is known as the Yarlung Sangpo in Tibet, and it swings around the Himalayas, around a peak called Namche Barwa, and comes into Arunachal. It comes in, it's a very narrow gorge. If you stand at Geling, um, you can actually see that it's, there's not too much water, except um, when the snow melt takes place. And then this river is the Siang in Arunachal, 300 kilometers of it, before it enters the plains to become uh, the Brahmaputra, the son of God. For the Assamese, um, the Siang and the Sangpo are not the Brahmaputra. Emotionally, in song, in folklore, it's the Lohit. It's the Lohit River, the Red River, which uh, the Assamese speak of, Bhopen Hazarika sings of. It's the Red River, the red, of course, signifying for them the blood. It's an emotional bond that they have, and it's a bond that, uh, 
occasionally turns not only to emotion but to agitation as we've seen over the last 30 or 40 years. This, the story of Tibet, uh, Tibet was always, contrary to what um, the British uh, thought and knew, Tibet was um, integral um, to the idea of India as we know it today. And it has contributed, as India has contributed, most uh, the Buddhism, the Mahayana Buddhism, all of the sects, the Gelug, the Kagyas, the Nyingmas, these all owe their origins. The Nyingmas are the oldest, and it's Guru Padmasambhav, who went to Tibet and was able to convince people, especially the then ruler and his sister and his wife, of the virtues, the path to salvation, and the extraordinary benefit to soul and body that Buddhism would bring. But court intrigue dictated that Guru Padmasambhav had to leave at some point. He came and meditated um, in a cave near Shingetsar in Arunachal and then went to Bhutan. There were others. There was a constant flow of traffic. When you think of people like the Chinese scholars who came to Nalanda, they came through the Himalayas. But it's Indian scholars who went the other way. So there was a flow, a kind of stream of pilgrims, of traders, of scholars, of men of religion, men who brought civilization to each other or elements of each other's civilization crossed the Himalayas. So the Himalayas were not, as we see them today or celebrate them, this wall that was impossible to cross. There's always been movement back and forth. But in the 19th century, the British didn't really know that, or they knew it, but they wanted to map it. And that's where the Survey of India comes, and that's... So this is... Um, that's the Survey of India. One man, Captain Montgomery, who's better remembered today, known for his measurement of K2, a feat that was um, uh, were extremely difficult. These are the Himalayas. Those who are familiar with this would recognize this as the Sela Pass in Arunachal. The prayer flags are Buddhist. They're not Indian in their origin. I understand that they came actually back to India from Sri Lanka. Buddhism has been a great force. It's moved across, not continents, but certainly large parts of the Asian continent, different cultures, different ways of... Uh, this is Shengetsu Lake with the tree trunks in them, which you can see on the side. That is um, a catastrophe that occurred very, very recently, about maybe about 60 or 70 years ago. This is the Brahmaputra, and that's a ferry crossing in, you know, as at dusk. It's crossing the big river. And on the right, you see, and I actually saw this happen before my eyes, um, the army was transporting this, this one-ton truck was on a ferry, and very slowly, very gradually, the truck slipped off the ferry. So, you can see the winches there, a lot of effort, generating sets, everything was tried, but ultimately it's that elephant over there uh, which pulled this one-ton truck out. The Brahmaputra is to be respected. It's a powerful river. It changes course. It all goes back and forth, north to south, um, in a cycle that used to be about 70 years, is now about 40 and in flood, the Brahmaputra is something that you need to be very, very respectful of. I've stood on the banks of this river at a police station, um, talking to the sub-inspector, and you hear this plop, um, plop again. So I asked him in Assamese, of course, and he said, no, the river is taking the police station. Um, so. 
you know, being reasonably North Indian, you know, my eyes grew wider. It didn't seem to phase him. But sure enough, the police station went into the river beginning about three hours from then. To his credit, he salvaged the records. To his credit, he brought the rec records out. And in hindsight, and of course, after some questioning, uh, I do remember that among those was the National Register of Citizens. So <laughs> there's, there is a story. So I'm going to, for the surveyors, I'm going to speak of these three men. Two of them were Kumaunis. They called the Pandits. They were not really Pandits. They were Rawats from the Joram Valley, the upper Joram Valley. And one of them was, and he's in the middle, he is um, um, a Sikkimese, a Lepcha. He was a tailor in the, in the bazaar in Darjeeling. And these were three of the men who actually went in but there were many, many more. At any point of time between 1860 and the end of uh, the 19th century, there may have been 15 or 20 of them, all in disguise. Like, uh, Nain Singh Rawat, who is on the extreme, on the left as I see him, is not in disguise, but they were disguised as pilgrims. They journeyed carrying the prayer wheel, carrying a staff in the staff, um, Normally, you would have Om Mani Padme Hum, but it concealed the measuring instruments, the theodolite, instruments that would record. Their task was not only to record the physical features, but also to take notes on the culture and the inhabitants. They were familiar, all of them, all of the Kumaruni Pandits or Ravats, all of the Himachalis who were sent in, and of course the Sikkimese lecture, because there was cross-border trade. Borax came from there, small amounts of gold came, salt went the other way. Occasionally, semi-precious stones would come from there. More importantly from here, finished jewelry would go. These were all items that were traded. Each one of them had a counterpart, a Tibetan counterpart, and it was a a bond forged in trust over generations. The son would take over from the father. And this trade was a thriving trade. So they knew the land on the other side of the border, at least in the vicinity of where they were. Unfortunately, the events of the mid 20th century closed all these borders. So in a sense, we've lost something. Uh, let me turn back to the British, um, well, it was the, Brit the East India Company, but the East India Company was uh, perhaps multinationals today would pale before it, but uh, certainly it's the Battle of Buxar, 1764, at which the Diwani of Bengal, the Sanad was handed over to them, the rights to collect revenue. And that's when organized administration in the British mold, not really the British mold, because Sher Shah Suri had done that centuries before, but the institution of the collector came into being. We've all been collectors in the civil services, but collectors of what? You were collectors of revenue, that's what you were. And the minute you become a collector of revenue, you have to map, you have to survey, you have to assess and you have to collect. And that's where the beginnings of survey came. The first of the, uh, this is the, that moment, I suspect slightly fanciful, this painting, when the Diwani is handed over. And of course, that is a collector. I can assure you that I have been a collector and I have not sat like this, <laughs> you know, hookah or no hookah. And, so here we are. This is James Rennell, the first surveyor. Well, he was called the Surveyor General, but he wasn't the Surveyor General of India. He was the Surveyor General of Bengal. But he produced remarkable maps. And in fact, the first map of the Brahmaputra 
very accurate because it was largely based on secondary information was published by him. This is the Brahmaputra. This is pretty much the scene that you could have well, visualized uh, something even 200 years before. And this is the, uh, this is a sketch map which was, it's based on one of his maps. There's Majuli Island in the middle, the largest freshwater island in the world, the largest inhabited freshwater island in the world, 1,000 square kilometers. Every year the river takes some and puts some soil on the other bank. That's in Bangladesh. So. This is Charles Lambton, and to him, I think we owe um, modern survey. He wasn't actually an engineer officer. Most surveyors of the 19th century were. He was an infantry officer who came with no experience of India. He came from Canada, but he began the triangulation of the subcontinent, the Great Arc, which began near Chennai. It moved north when it was north, south to north. It moved east to west and west to east. And the country was mapped in these triangles. Remarkably accurate, very hard work. And the attrition rate was high. Charles Lambton himself, he lies buried in what till very recently was an unmarked grave in Central East, um, India, in Vidharp. It was hard work. And, but to him we owe the beginnings of survey. Cadastral survey had been done, fields had been measured, again, pretty much as they are done now, by a chain link method, 22 links to a chain. But he brought in and improvised a whole array of instruments. This is typically, you know, what survey looked like then. And I have to admit, this is pretty much like the survey I did 35 years ago. This house is the house of George Everest, after whom the peak is named. George Everest, after a gap of 20, 25 years, succeeded Charles Lambton, and he became the Surveyor General of India. But he was everything that Charles Lambton was not. Charles Lambton was kind, he was caring, he looked after his men. Everest was, if you had to find a word in the dictionary, it was cantankerous, meaning he was very heavily and seriously cantankerous. But he pushed and drove his men. The peak is named after him, which was actually peak um, 15. But he may not have actually wanted that because through most of his life he rebelled against the, um, the practice of taking away local names and replacing them with names of surveyors or generals or viceroys. It happens all over the world. In fact, that very lovely lake with the tree trunks that I showed you somewhere at the beginning of this, Shengetsa Lake, which is such a wonderful name, and in Tibetan it's even better, is now called the Madhuri Dikshit Lake. <laughs> because she and Shah Rukh Khan made a film, um, part of which was shot on the fringes of the lake, and the army provided the local support, and the army said, ma'am, we'll take you up in a helicopter, and ma'am, we'll take you through paragliding through this. I think ma'am fled from there, but the name, unfortunately, is this. This is the house of George Everest. He forged a deal. He refused to go to Calcutta, of course, the headquarters of, um, um, at that time, the East India Company. Um, the deal was that he would be superintendent of the Great Arc, and that's the trigonometrical survey, the GTS, and be based at Mussoorie. And the survey of India came to Dehradun, which was not very far away. So that's where the Survey of India is even today. For some reason that I have not been able to fathom, the Naval Hydrographic Survey is also there, right next to it. But that's as far as you can go. That, of course, is very familiar. That's the peak. So these 
this is the triangulation, and the triangulation came to a stop when it reached the foothills of the Himalayas. And after that, there was no option but to send people in. So this is uh, George Everest. He actually looks a little more kindly than Charles Lambton. So this is how uh, uh, we should give credit to Radhakant Sikdar, who did the mathematical computations for the Everest peak. He, I suspect, well, he certainly remembered, but um, not in the same way that Everest is. But this was the beginnings of the British in Assam. Their interest um, was, was very frankly tea. There was a, it was a commercial interest, and that's what spurred a growing um, need to find out more about the area, survey the area, and what lay beyond. Assam, and I say this with some amount of experience, the Mughal army never actually, the Mughals never really got to uh, conquer Assam. Mir Jumla, the Fojdar of Dhaka, in the 17th century during Aurangzeb's reign, was sent there with um, a force, a very large force. It said that he had 3,000 elephants, which even by the standards of, of Sam were a lot, 20,000 cavalry, and very large contingents of uh, foot soldiers. The Assamese didn't play quite right they should have, but they didn't do it the right way. They simply retreated from their capital into the jungles. So the Mughal army went further up and further up, and between um, the monsoon and malaria, they were decimated. So half the army straggled back, except for a contingent of Sikhs, a jatha of Sikhs, fairly strong, and um, as one of their descendants recollected centuries later, they stayed back. The rest of the Mughal army sort of came out and went back to Dhaka and to Bihar. But the Sikhs stayed on. They're still there in four villages in Naugaon district of Assam. They speak Assamese, not Punjabi. As KPS Gill once said, they um, play carom, not hockey and they eat rice, not roti. But they're there, and uh, they, of course, intermarried, and um, as, as did many other invaders. The Mughals failed, others failed too. The, um, the Burmese came, and they're remembered, not particularly for their kindness, because they didn't show very much, but it's tea here, and this is the beginnings of tea in Upper Assam, which actually bound Assam to the rest of India. There were other reasons too, but the commercial imperative was very, very important. So this is the Mughal Empire, and as you can see, the pink. I think pink is an imperial, imperial color. It stops short of Assam. So... Um, the next big move, um, of course, is, is, is Kashmir and the battles that uh, took place. Chilemana is perhaps the, the end of another phase and the takeover of Kashmir by the Dogras. But as you can see, these are the two big catchments, the Brahmaputra and the Gangetic Basin, away from this is pretty much how we crossed the Brahmaputra until recently. Now there are seven bridges. At least when we served, there was one. And then a second one came in the late 80s. And this, of course, is the famous Bhopi Nazarika Bridge, inaugurated a year and a half ago. And this is how men, equipment, vehicles, everything moved on the Brahmaputra. So let me go back. There were other explorers too, other than, before I get on to the surveyor pundits, the British had um, apprehensions about Russian intent. 
about Chinese intent, and they were keen to know more. But the Chinese and many of the, what are now called the CIS republics or the former Soviet Union, the Silk Road in various manifestations moved through all of this. Small caravans, and you can see the camels in that. So, uh, this is, we are back to the triangulation. This is Thomas Montgomery, the man who actually trained these surveyors, and he trained them in Missouri. Uh, it was fairly innovative, because apart from the specialized equipment that they concealed, apart from the training that they got, much of the training consisted of their walking through Missouri with the drummer by their side. And the drummer would have an even beat, and the paces would be even so that they matched exactly 100 steps before a turn of the rosary or the prayer wheel. Rosaries, um, as you and I know, normally have 108 beads. The ones that they concealed had 100, which was easier. So Montgomery had that. He also trained them in making notes, and they were sent out. This is Missouri. Um, so they were disguised with these in, and, and merged with these small caravans that moved through Tibet. They disguised themselves, by and large, as traders, but also um, some of them were shown as pilgrims. So you can see the kind of equipment that they have. This is the report of the first um, um, surveyor, uh, that's um, uh, Nen Singh, to have made um, an impact because he was meticulous about his work. He worked slowly, but he worked long and hard. And this is the GTS. Um, Nen Singh Rawat never did actually participate in the GTS, but the government of India is the government of India, so the postage stamp shows him. But months are over. And this was where you, you know, the best of them tried to make it to Lhasa. Nen Singh did. Um, his cousin, um, Kishan Singh Rawat, did. Kishan Singh Rawat went further. He actually got into the, the hall of audience. He was terrified that he would be discovered. He went on to meet the Panchen Lama, and then he went northwards towards Mongolia. And every now and then, he'd send little notebooks back or paper rolled, paper in rolls. That's, that's a um, hundred rosary bead. It should actually show it better. But This um, is Eric Bailey. And um, in the early years of the 20th century, there was a renewed interest um, in, in Tibet. It had stopped for about 15 or 20 years. Eric Bailey was a civil servant. He was a botanist. He um, studied birds of the Himalayas. And he ended as the political officer in Sikkim. This is the Simla conference at which um, the McMohan line, which I suspect will come up later in the evening, um, it was, let me say, finalized or at least drawn, if not completely agreed to. Francis Young Husband. Francis Young Husband was a protege of Lord Curzon, ambitious. Um, he led the expedition to Lhasa, which had Sikh pioneers, a Bhutanese contingent of porters. It had uh, Gorkhas naturally and obviously. And uh, Francis' young husband journeyed to Lhasa, determined to show the Tibetans who exactly was boss in the area. Uh, I think his, he carried 67 white linen shirts. And uh, we now know that he used all of them during the expedition, and he could not wear them again. Francis' young husband, the expedition was, in one sense, an unqualified success at the, um, but it was also a massacre. The one battle, if it, that is a battle that was fought, 
left the Tibetans bewildered. They'd never seen organized bodies of armed force that let loose small artillery machine guns. Uh, many of the officers on that expedition, um, you know, they were sort of revolted at the idea of leaving so many bodies on the field. Francis' young husband stayed in Lhasa for three and a half months because having got there, the government of India, and that happens to this day, didn't quite know what to do with the expedition. And um, he came back and he had met many of the mystics and lamas in Lhasa. And oh, this is part of the force. This is uh, not the lama, but uh, it's, um, it's, la it's one of the lamas. It's an enigma in Tibet. That lama changed his life forever because he left the army fairly disillusioned um, six or seven years later, retired to England, and a decade or so down, he began to formulate a new religion. And if you read his work, uh, it is that the mountains can change you. The, and Buddhism attracted him, but he was not very sure of whether that was what he wanted. He wanted to establish his own religion. So this arch-imperialist sent there by an even more greater arch-imperialist turned completely. And that has been my experience in the Himalayas, in the Brahmaputra Valley, that um, um, as the chronicler of the Mughal army that went, uh, he wrote, he was an Arab, and he wrote, this land is not like our land. Its sky is not like our sky. Many of the men actually began to look at things differently, and so did Francis' young husband. So it's a story that has come a long way from the beginnings of survey to the mapping of a part of India which... Uh, part of, the, uh, of Asia that had not um, been mapped before. It is not as if there were, there had been other attempts. There were the great uh, Schlagenweid brothers, five Bavarians, um, extraordinary people. The Survey of India did not like them at all, but they journeyed across, skirted Tibet, and did some of the best mapping of the areas around Tibet. They could have followed the Sangpo down, but they didn't, and came out uh, through um, Tawang. But one, one more aspect, what happened to, to those pundits? What happened to all of the... Well, some of the early explorations ended in disaster. There were two British political officers who quite literally lost their head um, they were beheaded in, um, in Kiva. Of the Schlagenweid brothers, one was beheaded uh, in, just beyond the Karakoram. There were casualties, there was attrition. We know, the, we know the stories of those who came back. We don't know the stories of those who didn't come back. But Kintup the tailor, the lecture, he had an unusual experience. He was sent later. He was one of the younger ones, he was attached to this Chinese Lama who was headed back into Tibet. The Chinese Lama was obviously had been trained in a monastic establishment. He had the vows, he had everything. But he also had an amorous inclination. And um, on, in a village a little short of Shigatse, uh, the, the local headman quite literally um, caught hold of him, uh, let me say in a position that he should not have been with the wife of the headman. So in exchange, Kintup was sold to the headman. And what was Kintup's assignment? The last big mystery. He was to cut logs, mark them, throw them in the Sangpo, and on this side, that is the Indian side, on the Siang, 
the logs would be collected and picked up, there would be watches. And if the logs had the markings that they were supposed to have, then you knew that the Sangpo and the Siang were the same river, and that river would go on to be the Brahmaputra. But for one and a half years, he was in a slave, and Montgomery left for home and died within a year. So when Kintup the tailor actually got his freedom back, he first made a pilgrimage to Lhasa, being a good Buddhist, and then came back to do the job that he had been told to do. He cut the logs, he marked them, he threw them in the river, but there was nobody on this side. There was no one watching. The watchers had gone, Montgomery had gone, and nobody knew what was coming down. So Kintup crossed from the east of Namche Barwa, came down, he knew. He knew that it was the same river because he followed the same river down. And he went to, um, to uh, the Siang Valley and then disappeared into obscurity, went back to being a tailor. So when the Simla conference came, where the famous McMahon line came into being, they began to look for Kintu. They found him. By then he was old, he was blind, but he remembered. And he still had his notes. So even the last of the Pandit surveyors contributed to our understanding of uh, the Himalayas, of Tibet, and of the relationship, the physical relationship of the Sangpo, the Siang, and the Brahmaputra, and of course, then into Bangladesh. It's truly a transnational river. So many cultures, so many different languages, so many different tribes on its banks. So I think we owe them a debt. I think we are beginning to forget them, but maybe this is a story that we can keep in our minds. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, so moving on from Tibet to the Indo-Sino border, um, so Bruto already mentioned a lot about uh, Colonel Ajay Shukla in the introduction, but just as a recap, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Colonel Retired Ajay Shukla. Uh, he joined his regiment, Hodson's Horse, in 1979, and he served for 22 years in the Indian Army. And during that period, he served on the Indo-Sino border, and that's the focus of his talk this evening. In 2001, he left the army to pursue a journalistic career, and he's covered uh, battlefield journalistic stories in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Lebanon. Uh, he's, he also returned to Arunachal Pradesh as a journalist for a year. His widely popular blog, Broadsword, uh, is followed, and he's a, a frequent contributor to defense media uh, across India uh, and the UK. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll introduce Colonel Ajay Shukla. Let's hope this goes off well. So over the next half hour, we'll talk about India's most nettlesome border problem, foreign policy, security po policy challenge, uh, and that's the Sino-India border question, as India calls it. Why does India call it a question? Uh, because India does not acknowledge that there's a dispute. They say the border is settled, the McMahon line settled the border, the British surveyors in, the north, in Ladakh settled the border. This is just a question. So uh, that's what it's officially known as. We'll talk about what, how it arose, what its components are, and where it could lead. Uh, Muli talked in geographical time, one and a half million, you know, 150 million years. Uh, I'll talk in historical time. We'll cover a span of 2,000 years or so, uh, and we'll try and get to where we are. Uh, this is an important question. At this very moment, uh, China's President Xi Jinping and Prime Minister Narendra Modi are probably talking about exactly the same thing. So I'll just uh, sort of do that as my little sales pitch for the relevance of my talk. Uh, we commonly talk about a border dispute, but in fact, it's much more than that. It's a full-fledged territorial dispute over 135 square kilometers of territory, that's a chunk of real estate that's about the size of Bangladesh or Nepal. Uh, the territory is, this is, uh, one second, 
Yeah. The territory is spread across three very widely distributed areas, uh, separated by large gaps. The western sector you see over there, uh, that's the area in red. Uh, that's the Aksai chain. Uh, the primary bone of contention there is the high altitude desert plateau of Aksai chain, which is some 35,200 square kilometers. Don't, uh, don't get taken in by those figures there. Those represent the frontage, the border length. I'm talking now about the size of territory, 35,200 square kilometers. Uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, for China, the Aksai chain came to have major strategic value after the communist government built the western highway through the area in the 1950s, connecting Tibet with Xinjiang. You see that blue line over there connecting Xinjiang with Tibet. Uh, we only found out about the border, about this highway once it was actually done. Uh, now, Nehru realized that uh, the Aksai chain had very little strategic value for India. But having claimed it, walking away from that claim would prove embarrassing, it would prove difficult. So this was highlighted in Parliament in December 1961. Uh, Nehru, trying to talk down the value of Aksai chain to the Indian parliamentarians, told Parliament, and I quote, no tree grows anywhere in this wide area. There may be some shrubs, unquote. At that, Cong veteran Congress leader Mahavir Tyagi pointed to his own bald head and said, no hair grows on my head. Does it mean that the head has no value? <laughs> this is Nehru being nailed by his own uh, MPs to say that these areas, regardless of how barren and useless they may seem, no Indian leader is going to be able to walk away from their claims over there. Now, beside Aksai Chin, uh, in the Ladakh and western sector, India and China also dispute a 500 square kilometer pocket near Demchok, that's slightly to the south. Uh, and in the 1962 war, China occupied another 3,000 square kilometers in Ladakh and continues to hold that as well. Finally, in 1963, Pakistan ceded to China the Shaksgam Valley, that's that little brown uh, patch that you see over there. Uh, it's 5,180 square kilometers, just gifted to, to China. Uh, it's north of the Siachen Glacier, as you'll see over there. Uh, finally, in 1963, I told you, then this provisional agreement uh, of the sea session of the Shaksgam Valley uh, is subject to the final resolution of the Jammu and Kashmir question. If it comes to India, China will have to give the Shaksgam Valley back to India. No chance of that. Uh, this provisional agreement is subject to the settlement, as I mentioned, and now we'll talk about the central sector, which you see over there. That's the part which includes Himachal and Uttarakhand border. There's a relatively minor dispute over there, about 2,000 square kilometers, mostly over the Barahoti Plain. Now, that's a gap in the Himalayan wall. Uh, China claims it, India claims it too. Analysts believe the central sector will be easily settled once the eastern and western sector are settled. Uh, of which, as we mentioned, there is no sign as yet. Uh, the major portion of the dispute lies in the eastern sector or the border of Arunachal Pradesh and Tibet. That's the state of Arunachal Pradesh that you see over there. China's claim is ambiguous here. I've tried my best to get the mathematics right. I haven't been able to. China says the dispute here is over 90,000 square kilometers of territory. But the whole of Arunachal Pradesh, which China calls South Tibet, as you know probably, is less than 84,000 square kilometers. That's a gap of 6,000 square kilometers. And the Chinese maps show just 6, 65,000 square kilometers of Arunachal as Chinese. So it's unclear where the remaining 25,000 square kilometers claimed by China lie. Uh, I'm hoping somebody will be able to clarify this at some stage. This is the most contentious part of the claim. It relates to the districts of West Kameng and Tawang where the important Tawang Monastery lies. That's the monastery over there. It's a beautiful monastery. Uh, the eastern sector also encompasses the 220 kilometer long Sikkim border that you see over there circled in red. Uh, that's the only settled part of the Sino-Indian border. The rest of it is completely unsettled. So out of 3,488 kilometers of frontage that you have between India and China, 220 kilometers is settled. How did this territorial dispute originate? Now, 
for thousands of years, the Great Himalayan Wall, you see over there, those are the Arunachal Mountains of Gorichen, Kangto, Kangto 1, Kangto 2. Uh, the Great Himalayan Wall and other formidable mountain ranges like the Karakuram, the Kunlun, and so on, they separated the two countries the, from Tibet and China. Uh, these acted as territorial buffers. These are areas of extremely difficult terrain where neither country really wielded a presence or a power. <clears throat> Typically, uh, as you moved into these areas, uh, a ruler's sort of power and influence would gradually start shading off. And as you moved closer and closer into these areas, further away from the center, the power centers, the power would shade off and then you would reach an area where the power of the other power, in this case China, would gradually become uh, apparent. And as you journeyed further, it would grow in strength. So for over 2,000 years, China and India functioned and had their border like this. You know, this gradual shading off of influence between India and China. Uh, the only people who actually crossed the border were monks, travelers, like Xuanzang over here. You see his photo at the Wild Goose Pagoda in Xi'an, who journeyed between them. But this changed with the arrival of two colonial powers. Uh, Great Britain in the mid-18th century expanded northwards, that's towards Afghanistan, towards Central Asia, and advancing in the opposite direction, that southwest and southeast was Tsarist Russia. Now here are some figures just to show you how Russia expanded. For four centuries, Russia expanded 55 square miles daily, an average. That's 20,000 square miles per year. In the 16th and 17th centuries, Russian soldiers and horsemen expanded eastwards across that vast Siberian landmass, bringing millions of square kilometers under St. Petersburg, which was the capital then. Then in the 19th century, Russia and Russian troops, mainly Cossacks and so on, turned south, advancing through the Caucasus and subjugating the great Khanates of Central Asia. That's Russia over there. When the 19th century began, Britain and Russia were 2,000 kilometers apart in Asia, the nearest outposts of Britain and Russia. By the end of the 19th century, that's in the course of that one century, Britain and Russian outposts in the Pamirs were 20 kilometers apart in some areas. So countering each other became this key preoccupation between London and St. Petersburg. The great game changed the traditional idea of the border it was now very much a linear border. Confrontation was the name of the game. Uh, Afghanistan, the areas around Peshawar, the Punjab were now Britain's front lines in the great game. Now to establish control over these areas, Britain fought four major wars. Two wars were fought in Afghanistan, the first and second Afghan wars, both of which ended very badly for Britain. Uh, and the other two were the Anglo-Sikh wars. Uh, both of which ended in British victories. Uh, through the Treaty of Lahore, that's in March 1846, the defeated Sikhs ceded Kashmir to the East India Company. This was a notable thing because for the first time in this area, Britain now had a direct frontier with China, actually Tibet, but uh, China was sort of claiming suzerainty over Tibet at that stage. A week later, that's a week after the Treaty of Lahore, the Treaty of Amritsar was signed. The British sold Jammu and Kashmir to the Dogra rule leader Gulab Singh for 75 lakh rupees. Uh, in one week, Britain had got a border with China, and then in another week, it had given it away. London wanted to position China, at least in Xinjiang and Tibet, as a buffer against an expansionist Russia. So Britain was supporting China's claim of suzerainty over Tibet. Self-servingly, this policy, London was following this supporting policy towards Beijing only in the western provinces, which were at the center of the great game with Russia. In the eastern provinces, Britain continued pushing its commercial interests, predatory trade policies, the opium wars, and so on. Uh, it was exploitation uh, run rampant over there. Uh, now, to support China in the western uh, areas, the British explicitly prohibited the Jammu and Kashmir Maharaja Gulab Singh from further territorial expansion. Article 4 of the Treaty of Amritsar says over there, limits shall not be at any time changed 
without the concurrence of the British uh, government. Another clause in the Treaty of Amritsar pro promoted a stable and well-defined border with China. This is important because it shows that at that stage, Britain was trying to arrive at a modus vivendi with China uh, on a, for a stable border. And the absence of that stable border was what India inherited. So we are watching very closely about how Britain is going through all of this. Uh, it says, re, the, uh, this is the Dogra-Tibet Treaty of 1842. It reaffirmed the old established frontiers between Ladakh and Tibet. Uh, it's not quite clear what these old established frontiers were, but the aim was you know, to downplay the suggestion of any dispute. Orders to the boundary commissioners after the wars and so on, the British set boundary commissioners to, to, uh, uh, to survey a border, and they said, bear in mind, it is not a strip of more or less barren or even productive territory that we want, but a clear and well-defined border. This is shades of Nehru and Mahavir Tyagi over here. Now, north of the Pangong Lake in the Changchenmo Wild Valley, which was the Aksai Chin, there the survey was very difficult. It was, nobody lived there, so there were no administrative records. There was no uh, settled history. There was no uh, sort of clear parameters by which you could claim or disclaim a border. Uh, however, the British kept trying to uh, arrive at a border over there. Uh, they arrived at two basic deploy, uh, two basic alignments, I beg your pardon, a forward alignment and a, a rear alignment. Now, during the periods where Britain followed a forward border, border policy, that was where British power was rampant, British power was sought to be projected, they identified a boundary following the Kunlun Range. The Kunlun Range is to the north of Aksai Chin. That border included Aksai Chin in India. At other times when London was concerned about the feasibility and the costs, because like every good superpower, the cost was very important to them, uh, they proposed a more conservative border based on the uh, Karakuram range, which excluded Akshay Chin. So uh, India, independent India as it were, uh, and all this time, China maintained a complete studied silence. Every time Britain would send an emissary to China saying, let's talk about the border, uh, China would not reply because, again, like a good superpower, but the one in decline, it knew that you should never negotiate from a position of weakness. So they would just keep silent. So India inherited from the British a Ladakh-Tibet border that was never agreed to from both sides. The survey of India maps at the time of independence projected the Aksai Chin in a sort of vague color wash, uh, and it was written there, undefined territory. But in 1954, New Delhi took a decision to replace these maps with new ones that showed the boundaries to be fixed and following the most expansive British alignment. That's the Kunlun alignment, uh, which showed the Aksai Chin as wholly a part of India. In so doing, the British, the Indian government committed itself to a forward policy, which it did not have the military resources to enforce, which became a matter of national prestige, as exemplified by Mahavir Tyagi's bald head. In the eastern sector, there was no Russian threat, no great game, but we still emerged with a contested border. Now, how did this happen? It began with the rise of Gurkha power in 1768, when the Gurkhas overthrew the Newar ruler of uh, Nepal and established a Hindu kingdom there. Now, the British suddenly found themselves shut out of Nepal because they were supportive of the Newar rulers. Uh, and they began exploring alternative routes to Tibet. Their access to Tibet through Nepal was now no longer available. Sikkim then emerged as the best option. Continued treaties, uh, continued tensions with the Gurkhas led to the Anglo-Nepalese War of 1814 to 1816. That ended in a British victory and the 1816 Treaty of Sigauli. This saw the Kumao and Garhwal uh, regions being ceded to the British giving British India its first border with Tibet. This was the first even earlier than the one in Kashmir. But the British kept expanding eastwards. In 1820, they fought the Burmese who had expanded into Assam. Uh, they for, signed the Treaty of Yandabo in 1826. That gave the British most of Assam, including what is now Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, and for the British, this opened uh, up a range of options. Assam 
was extremely rich in resources. You, you, you find the same themes playing out. Huh? This is the same Assam agitation. Uh, this was the same imperatives and interests at play in British times. Exploitation of Assamese tea. Uh, you saw the, uh, the, the range of options. The Assam was rich in resources, particularly tea. But the no man's land north of it, there was this mountainous jungle, unknown terrain. This opened up the prospects of alternative routes to Tibet and southwest China. In 1886, for the first time, a British expedition went up the Lohit River, the river that Muli was talking about, the heart of Assam. Over the succeeding decades, the British established a tributary relationship with the tribes in Nifa, but sensibly never established an administration over there. With the Chinese Qing Empire in terminal decline now, this was the Qing Empire collapsing into itself at the turn of the century. Britain's entry into the area encountered no opposition from the Chinese. New Delhi only wanted to keep the hill tribes from inter inter interrupting or interfering with its lucrative exploitation of the Assam economy. The hill areas came to be recognized as excluded areas. They were officially given the term excluded areas and the terra incognita north of Assam was called the Northeast Frontier Agency, or NIFA. This continued until uh, the early 1970s. The stable British expansion into Assam was rudely jolted by the arrival of Lord Curzon, uh, who firmly believed in the need for a British forward policy. He, Curzon wanted forward policies everywhere, in Ladakh, in, the, in NIFA as well to preempt Russia from, from controlling Tibet. He was, he was really, uh, sort of for some strange reason, had a very uh, strong belief that Russia was on the verge of controlling Tibet. The, young, the, uh, the result was what Muli spoke about, the Young Husband Expedition in 1903-1904, to try and establish some form of British protectorate in Lhasa. The military aims were achieved. Uh, young Husband mowed down the Tibetans. They captured Lhasa, but London, with its eye on the big picture, where it wanted a more stable relationship with Russia, uh, overruled the Curzon young husband plan of going in subjugating Tibet. Uh, the great game was Russia was winding down. It officially finished in 1907, and the British government walked away from young husband's treaty. In 1906, the Anglo-Chinese Adhesion Agreement restored a policy of British non-interference in Tibet, provided Lhasa excluded all other European powers from its influence there. The power of the Chinese Amban, its nominal governor in Lhasa, was restored because they're again playing that game, trying to talk about and trying to promote a vision of Chinese control over Tibet in order to keep out the Russians. Now, this maneuvering became redundant in 1907. The Great Game officially ended. The Anglo-Russian Convention agreed to leave Tibet, I quote, in that state of isolation from which she has shown no intention to depart. Britain, however, needed to define its boundaries. And in 1913, it convened the Simla Conference. This was a boundary negotiation between the plenipotentiary representatives of British India. That's Sir Henry McMahon. Republican China, who was Yifan Chen, and Tibet, who was the Lonchen Shatra. The principal aim of the Tibet conference, incidentally, India believes it was all about the McMahon line, but it was actually to determine the boundary between inner Tibet and outer Tibet. That's the areas between Chinese administration and those under Tibetan control. Uh, the Tibetan conference resulted in the production of two maps. One showed the boundary between inner and outer Tibet. That's the one marked with the blue line, and the boundary between outer Tibet and, the, uh, and China, that's marked with the red line. The maps were initialed by each of the three plenipotentiaries. There was this subtext going on of conflict between China and Tibet, where China said the Tibetan plenipotentiary doesn't have the authority to sign because it's under China, but the British wanted to uh, get a treaty out of Tibet, so they had him over there. Uh, this was uh, initially signed, or rather initialed by China, and then later rejected. China, to this date, repudiates the uh, Simla Conference Treaty. 
It is noteworthy that the stated grounds for rejection, why did China reject the treaty? Not because of the McMahon line, but because of the delineation of the boundary between inner and outer Tibet. China wanted to project its influence more into Tibet. This is the Simla conference map of the McMahon line. This uh, de depicted only the India-Tibet boundary. It was in greater detail. Uh, copies of this map were exchanged between the British and Tibetan plenipotentiaries. And the India-Tibet boundary in the Simla map, which has come to be known as the McMahon line, reflected topography. You'll see the contours on the maps as well, as well as administrative realities. But the fact is, Tibetan administration never extended south of this line, except in three small pockets, Tawang, Mechuka, and uh, in the Lohit. Now, with the outbreak of World War I in 1914, this is, remember, the year that the Simla Conference was signed. They had, Britain had made this great uh, breakthrough in, 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 uh, in Tibet and in the northeastern frontier with India. But what happens? The World War I starts off. The British government now has very little mind space and even less people for implementing the McMahon line. The interwar years were a period of acute turmoil in, in uh, Europe. Uh, there was very little to do with the McMahon line and these treaties that occupied British uh, attention. Only in 1936 was Whitehall persuaded to publish the full text of the 1914 Simla Convention. And in 1937, for the first time, uh, the Survey of India maps showed the McMahon line officially as the boundary. But it was left to indep independent India to actually implement the agreement and independent India did it in 1951 when it sent in a platoon of Assam rifles uh, and actually occupied Tawang. Now, given the ambiguous borders inherited from the British, a territorial dispute or a ter border question or whatever we want to call it was almost preordained. In Ladakh, there was an unsettled border. In Nifa, there was an unsettled border. Uh, this was something that was going to happen anyway. Two new Asian powers, both acutely con uh, sort of conscious of their civilizational heritage, of their power, of their new emergence, they were never likely to compromise on what was rightfully theirs. Uh, conf confrontation became even more inevitable as China's military invaded Tibet in 1950 and quickly ran into opposition uh, about what it called democratic reforms uh, in, in Tibet, but which was actually just the imposition of communist uh, uh, ideology on a deeply religious Tibetan society. Setting the stage for war was the grant of Indian asylum to the Dalai Lama when he escaped from Tibet and the flat refusal of India's leaders to negotiate a mutual border with China. The result was war and everybody knows about it, a humiliating Chinese victory. Now for the next eight years after 1962, dialogue between India and China was completely frozen. There was absolutely no dialogue. There was no Indian ambassador in China. Uh, only in 1970, the chairman Mao tell the acting Indian ambassador in Beijing, who was Brajesh Misra, he pulled him aside at an official banquet lineup and said, I quote, this is Brajesh Misra told me this, how long are we going to keep on quarreling like this? Let us be friends again, unquote. Mao sent his compliments to India's president and Prime Minister Indira Gandhi through Brajesh Misra's uh, handwritten note. Yet with India drawing closer to the Soviet Union in 1971, that's the next year after this incident, China supporting Pakistan in its Bangladesh misadventure, it was a long time before dialogue began. Now China kept signaling, as Chao and Lai were saying from 1959-1960 onwards, that it was ready for an East for West swap, uh, in which India accepted China's claim in the Aksai chain, including the Western Highway, uh, in exchange for, India's ex uh, for Chinese acceptance of India's claim in NIFA, or Arunachal Pradesh, as it was now, now called from 1972 onwards. Until as recently as 1982, Deng Xiaoping, who was then the leader, signaled in an interview that an East for West offer was still on the table. But in 1985, for the first time in an interview, Deng Xiaoping said, that India would have to make, and these are the exact words he used, meaningful concessions in the East. Uh, that is taken to mean uh, Tawang. 
Now, the next major step was Rajiv Gandhi's visit to Beijing in 1988. It saw the next uh, sort of ratcheting up of the attempt to, to resolve the border. It was decided to set up a joint working group to finalize an agreement. The joint working groups met ad nauseum. It never achieved anything. Uh, in 1983, Narsimha Rao went to Beijing. Uh, there was the landmark agreement to maintain peace and tranquility on the LAC, the so-called Peace and Tranquility Agreement of 1993. This was signed by Narsimha Rao. And it was also agreed that the joint working group, which had achieved exactly nothing so far, would take up the task of forget about trying to resolve the border question, just align or make out a map showing the border of the line of actual control, which is the actual holdings of India and China. Even that has not been done so far. Uh, however, the 1993 Peace and Tranquility Agreement has ensured that the China-India border has remained peaceful since 1975. The last shot fired on the border was in 1975. And this is a far cry from a similarly disputed border, which is the India-Pakistan border. So there are confidence building measures. There are agreements of 2005, 2012, 2013. These have held through the most trying times, including in the Doklam standoff. Not a shot has been exchanged, as I mentioned, since 1975. The next major boost to negotiations took place in 2003 when Vajpayee visited Beijing. The two leaders agreed to appoint special representatives of the top leaders to explore from the perspective I'm quoting of the overall bilateral relationship, the framework of a boundary settlement. They decided that forget about technical negotiations about claims and so on, let's take this up to a strategic level. More than 20 rounds of negotiations have been held between the special representatives, nothing's happened. In 2005, and this is the sole uh, achievement of the special representatives dialogue, they reached a political parameters and guiding principles agreement, which said that the boundary should follow easily identifiable geographical features and safeguard due interests of settled populations in the border areas. Uh, now this is regarded as an advantageous uh, sort of agreement for India. It referred to easily identifiable geographical features, which means the McMahon line watershed, and it specifies that safe interests, the safeguarding the interests of border populations, India takes that to mean that Tawang will not be uh, subject to a disruption by being handed over to, to China. Uh, China had resisted these formulations earlier. Why did this happen in 2005? Because that was the year this US-India relationship was becoming very worrying for Beijing. The defense cooperation agreement was signed the U.S.-India nuclear deal was on the cards and so on. Uh, and on Wen Jiabao's visit, the Chinese also released a new official map that showed Sikkim as a part of India. This was a small, but let's, it's the only part of the border that is a, has been actually agreed to, so let's call it an unprecedented breakthrough. Since then, there's been little forward motion on the boundaries. Now, since then, India's military has built up a formidable presence on the LAC. It would be difficult for China to win a clear military victory anywhere, as it did in 1962. But with both sides now patrolling aggressively, there is always the chance that some hothead somewhere, <clears throat> there could be some spilling of blood. There have been major patrol confrontations in Dolat Beg Oldi in 2013, Chumar in 1914, Doklam 2017, which were fortunately diffused. But until there's a final threat settlement, the threat of use of armed force and the breakout of a conflict will always hang over the line of actual control. Thank you.
there's uh, little for me to say, really, after that. Um, but since I've, uh, I've been asked to say a couple of words, my name's uh, Lieutenant Colonel Nick Wood. I'm the uh, military advisor in the British High Commission in New Delhi. Um, and it's my very great privilege today to uh, introduce to you um, Major General Ian Cardozo, Ati Vasish Seba Medal, Senna Medal. Um, clearly a war hero that really needs no introduction, um, but uh, I, I did a little work and I, I find that he is an alumni, obviously, of the National Defence Academy and the Indian Military Academy, where as a cadet he became the first cadet to win both the gold and silver medals while he was there. He commissioned into the 5th Gurkha Rifles in 1954 um, and had an illustrious career, as we've just seen. Uh, in 1971, he was at the Defence Services Staff College in Wellington when the course was shortened for the war in East Pakistan. He was uh, summoned to replace the battalion second in command who had been injured and he himself uh, went into action. Uh, we have just seen the story of how he was forced to take rather dramatic action with his own cookery um, to save his own life. And I'm sure if you're uh, prepared to... Uh, supply him with a patiala peg or two, he'll give you the full details of that uh, uh, rather, rather unsavory uh, evening. Um, however, in so doing, he's shown uh, the absolute spirit and courage of a true hero. He's proved that he has self-discipline, and as we've seen in the little video there, a driving ambition to succeed. And it's a true inspiration uh, to know this officer. He's authored several books on courage and bravery, in combat, including two on India's highest gallantry award. So who better to speak to you today on the history of the Param Veer Chakra? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, I would like to thank all of you for giving me this opportunity to share with you the aspects of courage and gallantry of the Indian Army and the Param Veer Chakra. All of you would probably know that the Parambir Chakra is India's highest reward for courage in battle. Only an act of courage of the highest order merits this award. And those awarded the Parambir Chakra are considered to be the bravest of the brave. In the last 72 years since independence, only 21 awards have been made, and of these, 14 are posthumous. The award is made by the President on Republic Day. The joy of independence of 1947 was soured by partition which divided the subcontinent into India and Pakistan. This was followed by the first Indo-Pak War of 1947-48. At that time, India had not instituted its own awards for gallantry and permission was asked for from Britain that could we give British awards like the Victoria Cross, the Military Cross, and the Distinguished Service Order to, to people who did well in battle in this war. But Britain was unable to sanction this request for the simple reason that India and Pakistan were both part of the same Commonwealth, and how could these awards be given to people who were fighting each other and from the same commonwealth. So India was asked to institute its own awards. Interestingly, the institution and the design of these new awards has a love story behind it. At that time, there was a Captain Vikram Khanolkar who was commissioned at Sandhurst and he went for a holiday to Europe and there on the ski slopes of Shamanai in Switzerland, he met and fell in love with a young girl whose name was Eva Linda Yvonne Made Maros, the daughter of a Russian mother and a Hungarian father. It was love at first sight, but both the parents of both sides took a long time to decide. And finally, after two years, they consented to the marriage. Linda, however, became enthralled with all things Indian. And after marriage, entered fully into the Indian way of life. She converted to Hinduism, learned to read, write and speak Hindi, Marathi, Sanskrit. She de de delved deep into Hinduism 
Indian mythology at Patna University. She learned Hindi classical music and dance forms and time became a talented artist, singer and dancer. And she changed her name and came to be known as Savitri Bai. It was around this time that the need for Indian gallantry awards arose and the Adjutant General, Major General, Hira Lal Atal, taking into consideration Savitri Bai's proficiency as an artist and a painter and a dancer and a deep knowledge of Hindu mythology, requested her to design India's awards for courage in war. She accordingly designed these awards, which were notified by the government of India in 1950, and awarded retrospectively to those who had done well in battle. Strangely, little did Savitri Bai realize or dream that the first award of the Parambit Chakra would be given to her own brother-in-law, Major Somnath Sharma, who was killed at Badgam, fighting Pakistani raiders while protecting the Srinagar airfield at which Indian Army units were being inducted to save Jammu and Kashmir. Greatly outnumbered by the marauding hordes from Pakistan's northwest frontier, Major Somnath Sharma with his company held the attackers at bay, but in the process, Somnath Sharma was killed. Thanks to his courage and leadership, Srinagar airfield was saved, allowing the induction of 800 Dakota sorties that flew in Indian Army units literally overnight. Major Somnath Sharma's last words were, the enemy is just 50 yards away, but we shall fight to the last man and the last round we will not give an inch of territory away when the battle was over, the bodies of over 300 Pakistani soldiers were recovered. Somnath Sharma's brothers joined the army and reached high rank. The youngest brother became the chief of army staff and the middle brother retired as the engineer in chief of the Indian army, affectionately known as Tindi Sharma. He was also a paratrooper and did his last jump and he was well into his 80s. His sisters all married army officers and their father was the director general of the Army Medical Corps and is probably the only Indian army officer who served during World War II on both the Eastern and the Western fronts. The medal is made of bronze. On the obverse side of the medal are the symbols of the Vajra, the thunderbolt fashioned from the thigh bone of the sage Dadichi who gave up his body to the gods to fashion the deadliest weapon on the planet and also Shivaji's sword, Bhavani. The ribbon of the PVC is purple, a combination of the colors of the three services, red for the army, dark blue for the navy, and sky blue for the air force. Purple is also the color of the heart. The PVC, the Parambi Chakra, is equivalent of Britain's Victoria Cross and America's Medal of Honor, all three being the highest awards for gallantry for courage of all the three countries. If the PVC Parambi Chakra is, is awarded a second time, a bar with a miniature of the Vajra will be borne on the ribbon. It is important to understand that the fate of a nation in war depends upon how well men fight. And how well they fight depends upon courage and morale. Courage and morale, therefore, need the attention of every Indian leader, both military and civil, so that they may guide India towards victory in battle and to find her own true destiny. Courage is both physical and moral. It is also both individual and collective. It shapes the attitude of all officers and men. It shapes the morale of an army. Morale is an important principle of war. And Field Marshal Slim has said that success in battle is contingent on high morale. And the proportion of morale to the physical is 10 is to 1. Morale, therefore, is extremely important. You destroy morale and you destroy an army. 
and you destroy an army and you destroy a country. This is something that needs to be known and understood by every politician and bureaucrat, and every citizen, in fact. All countries need to learn from the past. Unfortunately, the only lesson that we learn from the past is that we do not learn from the past. Kautilya, the great strategist and military thinker who wrote the Arthashastra, has valuable advice on governance, kingship, strategy, tactics, administration, and how soldiers should be treated. The moot point is how many involved in governance, administration, and strategy have taken the trouble to read him, understand what he says, and implement his principles. Lord Moran, in his book on courage, says that courage has its roots in mor morality and that a man of character in peace is a man of courage in war. That courage is intrinsically linked with sacrifice and that a man who is selfish in peace cannot be unselfish in war. So what is it that makes men of courage perform outstandingly against overwhelming odds? Are they ordinary mortals who do extraordinary things in challenging circumstances? Or are they rare persons who do extraordinarily well in any situation? In my 39 years in uniform, I have taken part in three wars, led attacks by day and night, conducted ambushes and been ambushed myself, conducted raids across the border, nowadays called surgical strikes. I have seen close companions die, get grievously wounded, but I have never, ever heard an officer or a soldier complain. The answer to high morale, therefore, is in training. Sound values, strong qualities of character, belief in God, self-reliance, and reliance on one another where caste, creed, and community do not matter. It also matters on, depends on great regimental spirit and unity in diversity. These are factors that contribute to high morale. It is invariably high morale that pulls a human being or a group out of an impossible situation. An example is what happened to my own battalion in 1971 when we were landed over 100 kilometers behind the enemy lines. We fought the enemy without food, without water for nine days, nine nights. We had no medical facilities because they were destroyed. And yet, when the surrender took place, three brigadiers, two full colonels, 173 officers, 290 JSUs, and 8,000 troops surrendered to us. We were just 532. There are many stories to share about value, about valor and courage, but we do not have the luxury of time. So I will tell you of only one story, the story of Arun Ketarpal, who at that time was the youngest recipient of the Parambi Chakra. He was awarded the Parambi Chakra for his brave conduct at the Battle of Basantar in the 1971 war. Carried away by his energy, and enthusiasm during the battle, he threw his own personal safety away to the winds. He had destroyed three Pakistani tanks, but his own tank was hit and had caught fire. His squadron commander yelled at him over the wireless, Arun, bail out, your tank is on fire. But con conscious of how important it was to stop the breakout of Pakistani armor, Arun said, no sir, my gun is still firing, and there is one more tank to destroy. Both Arun and the enemy tank commander fired simultaneously. Arun's ta tank was hit for the second time, and he was killed. Interesting, however, is the sequel which followed. Many years after the war, diplomats and soldiers carried out what is known as the 
twin-track diplomatic initiative where retired soldiers and diplomats crossed borders to find solutions to problems between India and Pakistan. Arun's father, Brigadier Khetarpal, was invited to be part of this initiative, but he refused. However, in his 81st year, he felt, why don't I take advantage of this opportunity and go and see my old home in Sargoda? And so he went across and he took gifts with the Poe's host in Pakistan. He was received at Lahore and taken to Sargoda, where he was feted and he was very pleased to see his old house and meet people who knew his parents and his grandparents. And then he came back to Lahore to stay with this brigadier. At night, prior to his departure to India, after dinner, he was sitting with the Pakistani brigadier's family in the bedroom. And the Pakistani brigadier said, Sir, I've been wanting to ask you, tell you something for a long time, but you never came. And now that you are here, I do not know how to put it across to you. So Brigadier Ketarpal, who was very much senior, said, Son, what is it? Tell me. And he said, Sir, I killed your son. Now, can you imagine the feeling of Brigadier Ketarpal? Put yourself in his shoes. What was he to say? What was he to think? The person who killed his son was his host. He was living under his roof. And then, while still ruminating on what to say and what to think, the Pakistani brigadier said, Sir, I salute your son. He was outstandingly brave. And he was so because of his father and his mother. And he and I were both fighting for our own countries. We only did our duty. I'm sorry, sir. I lived and he died. And that night, Brigadier Ketarpal ruminated on what had happened. And he thought to himself, this is what, all, what war is all about. We are taught to kill or be killed. My son had also killed many Pakistanis in the four tanks that he destroyed. And this officer who killed my son, both of them were only doing his duty. That is the way that most of us in uniform force ourselves to think. We have to do our duty and we do it without pity, without remorse. We don't think of the past. We have to accept the situation and the reality as to what it is. And the next morning, both the brigadiers took a photograph with their hands around each other. What happened subsequently when I interviewed Brigadier Ketarpal and I said, does Mrs. Ketarpal know about this? He said, no. So I said, aren't you going to tell her? He said, no. I said, when my book is published and she comes to know, what will she say? And he answered something which I think all of you must know about the caliber and the strength of the women in the army, the strength behind every soldier. And he said, she is an army officer's daughter. She is an army officer's wife. And she is an army officer's mother. She will understand. So that is all about Harun Ketarpal. As mentioned earlier, there are many stories to tell, but time doesn't permit. I would, however, like to touch upon two young officers who fought in the Kargil War, who won their Parambi Chakras in Kargil in 1999. Their names were Lieutenant, a very young officer, Manoj Pandey, and Captain Vikram Batra. I'm sure you heard their names. Both these young officers led their platoons and companies in attack after attack, always leading from the front. 
Kargil was fought at heights beyond 15,000 feet, where temperatures were minus 30 degrees Celsius. Air was rarefied, you could hardly breathe. The Pakistanis who held the high ground thought they were in an invincible position, but they did not reckon with the courage of the Indian soldier. Led by his intrepid officers, who coloured the Kargil snow crimson with their blood. Manoj Pandey, a lieutenant, said, I do not fear death, and if I die, I will kill death. A brave philosophy for, young so, for one so young. And when he was dying from grievous wounds in the last attack, he said, I regret that I have only one life to give for my country. Vikram Batra, equally brave, a little more senior, said, Dil mange more, and that is, the challenges which we face are not big enough. We are bigger than that. And before he died, he said, I will haul the Indian tricolor on the objective I am destined to capture, or I'll come back wrapped in it. That is exactly what happened. Oh, and he said, but uh, no, he said, I will haul the tricolor on the top of the objective which I will capture, or I'll come back wrapped in it. Prophetic words, he was killed finally after a number of successful attacks, saving the life of a soldier. What needs to be understood is that when men and officers go into battle, most of them know that they will never come back. Leadership, therefore, has to be of a very high order. Because when an officer leads, he doesn't say, the Indian Army officer leads, he doesn't say, Tum aage jao, mai He says, Mere piche move, follow me. And the Indian soldier, which is the best in the world, follow him because they know that their Saab is right in front, facing the maximum danger. And when that Saab is killed, the JCUs and the NCUs and the soldiers take up the challenge and capture the objective. I will digress from the script and tell you about what happened at the Battle of Dograi. When Desmond Haid captured Dograi with the three jats, the brigade could not link up and they had to come back. They considered this to be an affront to the name of the unit. And he said to them, many had already died, and he said to them, we have to capture Dograi. The honor of our battalion rests on its capture. Many of you will die. And if I die, I want you to carry my body into Dograi because that's where I want to be when Dogra is captured. And then he asked them, where will we be tomorrow morning? And they all said, in Dogra. And Dogra was captured for a second time. Officers face the maximum casualties in war because they are out there in front. In my own battalion, in the 71 war of 14 days, we started the war with 18 officers, four got killed, and seven got wounded. Only seven survived. And see, the answer to this probably is a word, a four-letter word called love. Love may not be a very military word, but it is on the altar of love that men and women in uniform put their lives in the line of fire and disappear in the smoke and fire of battle. It is this attitude that differentiates the profession of arms from all other professions, and it is this acceleration for adventure that the conquest of fear that makes our lives so different, a life that has no equal. As Helen Keller said, life is an adventure or it is nothing. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So that kind of brings us to, but if you, if you will have some questions, I guess, then you can ask 
Any question that you would like to? Is there a question coming up? Yeah. Sure, sure. Question for you, Ajay. So, you know, you repeatedly mentioned that these teams that have met up on the border issue have received nothing. And the ones that are in process are also nowhere near achieving anything. In your own assessment, is this a game being played? Is it such a difficult problem? Or neither of them really want to achieve anything? Uh, I'm giving you my personal opinion and read of the situation. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I'm giving you just my personal opinion and read of the situation. Uh, for India, resolving the border problem has been an uh, has been an order of magnitude greater in importance than it has been for the Chinese side. For the simple reason that we deploy soldiers year in and year out on the border and have a very heavy financial and manpower commitment. Uh, whereas China lays off from the border, uh, borders are held by a very thin smattering of border guards and they have their troops in cantonments and comfortable sort of cantonments uh, went to the rear. Uh, the reason, of course, is that their infrastructure is much better, which allows them to build up quickly on the border when required. Ours is much further, so we need to position greatly. But that has given us a greater stake in resolving the border question. Uh, for China, and this is my opinion, China has consistently uh, sort of uh, put it on the back burner. They keep talking about this being a problem left for a wiser generation to follow and so on and so forth because they believe that keeping India deployed on the border, constantly worried about a Chinese attack uh, or, a, or, or a patrol infringement or something, disbalances decision making in the country. Uh, and it allows uh, or it forces Indian policymakers to focus on the border itself rather than to look beyond the border into Tibet where we are really in a position to do damage to, to China. So China, I think, is trying to keep attention focused on the border and prevent India from playing any of the many cards that we have in Tibet. Uh, as you know, there are 100,000 Tibetan refugees, now probably 120,000 in India. The Dalai Lama is here, the Tibetan government in exile is here. We have at least four battalions of Tibetan special forces that can create real problems in Tibet. I think China doesn't want a border settlement because it wants India to be disbalanced and focused on the border rather than on Tibet. Malian chess. So, uh, yeah, one is very impressed and affected uh, by the courage shown and the morale of the Indian Army and the fact that the officers lead the uh, men behind them. Uh, it's probably unique in the world, that's what I've heard. But my question is that uh, in the current situation where there is no ongoing war but just episodes and politicizing the army the way it is being done these days under the current administration, is that not diluting uh, our respect for the armed forces? And, and your question is to? Jal Cardoso. The Indian Army has always been apolitical. We fight for our regiment, we fight for our country, and as I mentioned, uh, everything is based on love. What the politicians do is up to them. Now, you are asking a soldier about something which is political. So I, I find it difficult to answer, except to say that what you said is right. 
The politician has tried to manipulate the situation for votes. The army says, after the Bombay attack, we can handle, handle people who come by boat, but we cannot handle people who come by boat. <laughs> so therefore, it is a question that is difficult to answer for a soldier, but what you said, I agree. Any other question? Yeah, sure. Ladies and gentlemen, my question is to Major Cardozo. Sir, I have read two of your books, uh, the one for 1971 war and the other sinking of INS Kukri. Uh, right now in the video it was mentioned that you cut your own leg with the Kukri and you have written a book about another guy who sank with his Kukri, uh, Manitanath Maga. So my question is, what goes on in your mind at that point when a captain decides to go down with his boat or you decide to cut your own leg and continue with the mission which has been given to you? What is that basic thinking? This is, I want to know, is this something which you are taught or how does this come to you? First, I'll talk about uh, Mahindranath Manga. It is typical of an officer from the armed forces that he had to fight with whatever was available. The Kukri, the Kirpan, and the Kuthar were World War II vintage minesweepers, frigates which had a range of just 2,005 meters, 2,500 meters, that is 2.5 meters, uh, uh, kilometers range. Whereas the, the Scorp Scorpion submarines of Pakistan had a range of 25,000 meters. So he was fighting with his back to the wall. And secondly, they had initiated a, a, a an experiment of, of sonar on his, on his uh, frigate, which slowed him down even further. He did not say that I cannot fight this battle with the equipment that I have. He said, I will do my best with what, whatever I have. Now, when the Hangor, the Pakistani submarine, fired a torpedo, which got the, the the uh, Kukri, right in the middle. It sank within minutes. He was on board, on the top of the deck. He could have saved himself. But he said to himself, 200 of my sailors are locked down below. How can I save myself when my men are locked and going to die? And so he decided to go down with his ship. He gave his life belt to another sailor and said, son, save yourself. So this is an act of cold courage. And I think he deserved not only the Mahavir Chakra, perhaps he could have been given the Paramir Chakra. Why? It depends upon the powers that be. But that was my understanding of how he must have thought. As for myself, I think I've been, giving, been given a lot more credit than is due. When I stepped on a mine, my leg was in a bad shape. I was disgusted with what it looked like, and I decided to chop it off, which I did. I think that anyone in my position, any soldier in my position, would have done the same. So that's it. There was no medicine, there was no morphia, there was no pethidin, there was nothing to cut it with. So I had my kukri, which is a good weapon, and I cut it off. I told my batman, 
because the doctor took a long time to come. He had no instruments. And I said, go and find something. After 45 minutes of waiting, I told my batman, where is my kukri? So he said, here it is, sir. I said, cut it off. He said, sir, in Nepali, I cannot do that. Doctor said, I intizam kar. Wait for the doctor. I said, no, we waited long enough. I cut it off. So that's how it was. I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. First of all, this has been the best history lesson I've had uh, thus far from Indian history, so thank you so much. You never learn so much. And um, I salute the courage of all of you because I think, you know, I just got reminded about the immense sacrifice that all of you have made for us to really enjoy such a free space that we do in India today. So thank you. My question is really, uh, you know, to, to any one of you, um, um, the first speaker spoke about you know the Indo-Tibet border, and then that was followed by the Indo-Sino border. And at that point in time, the border was created in such a way to protect British interests, which were really uh, you know partly administrative. Yes, sorry. Okay. Further, okay. Is this okay? Yeah. All right. So partly administrative, uh, you know, and then partly economic on the west and then the east, as you explained. And at that point, it was not India ruling itself, where it was not India protecting its own economic interests and defense. It was more a third party who was looking at, uh, you know, let's say, a balance of their interests using India in that sense. What, in your point of view, is you know that balance of power that uh, is best aligned to India's economic and defense interests today, vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, let's say, um, you know. Uh, Pakistan, China, Russia, India, and then the West, whether it's Europe or the US. I, I hope I've articulated it in a way that... Uh, you're asking about what, if, what are current India's balance of power options and what, what alliances and... Border, huh. Yeah, with respect to the border, because as I understood from your talk, the border issue was really created in a pretty manipulative or let's say the best administrative way to protect administrative interests, you know, colonial administrative interests, and then their economic interests. But it wasn't, you know, in the interest of India trading with its neighbors or the powers that be, right? But if you look at it from an, a free India point of view, what, you know, how do we play the border issue? to ensure that India is, you know, I mean, it serves India's trade interests as well as defense. Because as I understand, you know, a border is not only about defense, it's a lot more about trade as well, right? Mm -hmm. So where is that power balance? And I don't know if, you okay. know. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, uh, my answer is going to sort of uh, be critical of the people who are going to pay for my drink after this. <laughs> this thing. So I hope they will forgive me. Uh, but Britain was here as a colonial power pursuing interests of the empire uh, and the, the, the local interests of Indian. Uh, so there wasn't even an India at that stage. There were different platforms, different states, different princely states. Uh, you've heard about all of that day. So the lesson that comes out is that an imperial power, or for that matter, any power, will always at every stage be taking decisions based on their national interests and not on yours. Uh, one of the great things about Indian foreign policy has been the reluctance, the marked reluctance, in fact, in many cases, outright refusal, uh, to come into an alliance with a country where you will at times be forced by that alliance to take steps that might go against your national interests. For example, let's take a country like Australia. Uh, by virtue of being part of the innermost circle of a Western alliance, the five eyes as they are called, uh, the US, Canada, UK, New Zealand and Australia. That's the tightest alliance that there is in the world today. Australia finds itself getting involved in conflicts in Afghanistan, gets in, involved in conflicts in uh, Iraq. They send troops to go there, fight and die over there. 
And when you ask an Australian policymaker, oh, why are you doing it? What's your interest in Afghanistan? He'll say, this is just the insurance premium that we're paying. These are the words they use. This is the insurance premium that we are paying. Uh, so, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult question that you've asked. It's a very deep question. Are alliances good or bad? Is the cost too high? Uh, or is it just that lonely furrow that India plows, though at one stage we came pretty close to the Soviet Union, let's admit. Uh, but it's a lonely furrow that we plow. We, uh, we sort of uh, follow our own foreign policy interests. We align with other countries based on policy and need and issues. But uh, we don't get the benefits of an alliance the way we would have had we actually gone into that. So your, your question goes to the heart of Indian foreign policy. Uh, so far, we've, we've been a determined sort of non-allied country. We form partnerships. We form alliances. Uh, we form partnerships, but we don't form alliances. Uh, and on a slight, slightly different uh, note, you know, the, your, the, the thanks that you gave at, uh, at the start of your question, I just want to tell you that all of us who join the military do not join it as a grim national service duty. We join it because it's the best lifestyle there is. It's a wonderful thing to be a part of the army. It's wonderful to be part of a unit, to be part of a brotherhood that is so tight. And you know, wherever we go, wherever we uh, are in the world, 20 years after I've retired, I'm still very much a part of the family uh, of, of armed forces. So uh, I mean, there are, there are horrible instances. There are times when you have to lay down your life and so on. But it's a band of brothers. It's a very tight, close-knit community. And it's great fun being a part of it. Great. Uh, when I was a young officer in the battalion, I asked for, for leave after a year. And they asked me, where, are you, where do you want to go? So I said, I want to go home to Bombay. They said, no, you're not going to Bombay. You're going to Nepal. You're going to your men where they stay. And a, a Johnny, we call Gurkha's Johnny. The Johnny who was going on leave will take you to his house. And you will stay there for three days. And he hand you over to the next house, and the next house, and the next house. And two months were spent with the families of my men. I met their mothers, their fathers, their grandfathers, their grandmothers, their children. I knew them. I learned the language. I learned the dialects. I learned the songs. I learned the dances. They told me about history of the battalion. World War I, World War II. And when I came back, my men would die for me and I would die for them. That's what Ajay is talking about. The close bonds. So this is what the army is all about. Nothing can compare to it. May I say one more thing? Sure, sir. And I want to tell you about the women in the army. One incident. When a CEO of my battalion was killed in Sri Lanka, and there were JCOs and other officers and men who were killed, and the bodies came to a place called Sagar. And the CEO's wife had two children. And the bodies came to the house, and they were lying on the lawn. And the children were crying. And the mother said, you are the CEO's children. You cannot be seen crying. Go inside and wipe your tears. If you are going to cry, what will happen to the families? And that is what the army is all about. We do what we do because we are supported by our wives and our mothers. Brings um, that makes things much real, and, and it was such a um, uh, when I hear it, m most of my childhood experiences kind of come uh, lively. But I really wanted to bring back to uh, the topic of this discussion. Uh, the title was about building bridges. Um, sometimes we take the route of war to 
at the end of the day, it's about dispute resolution. Um, there are some matters that cannot be discussed, and then we take the root of the war. So I wanted to ask people who have served um, a long time is that, based on the knowledge of war, have we really built bridges? Um, have we made any progress on that? Because we are keep on doing it. And the second part of that question is that, have we made any progress on the way we think about war? Because we think it in a very romantic way. It's not. So would you speak a little bit about that for anyone? Is have we made any progress on building actual bridges? Because we have fought war. And based on that knowledge, have we built any? Because? And the second part is, have we made any progress on the way we think about war? Can I take that question for a second? So uh, before the answer, I think the, the you've asked a fantastic question. So can you imagine that we have had this relationship between the British High Commission and us, right? And there are a whole bunch of extremely difficult things which we discuss, as you can see. And uh, the point is, uh, you can discuss, uh, is war a final solution? But the point is that if we are unable to have a conversation around very difficult issues uh, in a sensible manner, right? Uh, without being dismissive or rude or abusive, I think that is an art. So uh, let me also make a public statement, which is that when we chose these subjects and we got these speakers in, whether they are from the UK or from India, it is not scripted. There is no approval. And we don't edit it. And then it goes out. I mean, we edit it to the point it should look good. But I think it's a good example that if the entire cast in this whole production, and there are a lot of people, I would imagine, I mean, Ben and uh, Nick have been part of this team for the last two to three years. We pick up subjects which are pretty complex and, you know, pretty nettlesome. But the ability to put it up out there, I mean, like, like Muli said, you know, decisions are taken at a point in time with available resources, data, 50 things are happening. We just pick up one and then we discuss it. But the point is that those people would have taken decisions in the best interest of what they felt was right. But unless we discuss it, we wouldn't know. And frankly speaking, when we started this, I had no idea at the age, at age 61 that all this was happening. And we don't read about it. Unless we meet people who have actually done it, we wouldn't know. So to that extent, I think the more we discuss, and we discuss the most difficult and complex things, we won't move forward. That's my view. But the ability to discuss it in a sensible manner is an art. But that, I think, is visible. If you would like to respond. Muli, would you like to say something? Yeah. You haven't? Muli, yeah. I think, why didn't you respond? You know, um, the importance of dialogue, of informed dialogue, as a nation, and I've felt this, that there's too much about Fully hit it. In 1983, we went through one of the most traumatic elections. As a young district officer, I had 183 companies of armed force. I'm glad to say that I didn't need most of them. The important thing was to begin a dialogue with the agitators to try and understand their point of view and try and make them understand the point of view that you were putting forward. We went through that election with, I must say, when I look at what happens elsewhere today in the country, the level of antagonism, of confrontation, of violence. So, I think that fora like this are important to bring out the issues, to talk sensibly. In fact, you probably gain more by listening than by speaking. And that's an art that we've forgotten. But just to come back to your question, 
you know, we talk of borders, we talk of national interest, nationalism. Most of these are new. I must say that these surveyors actually created borders. Because earlier between great civilizations, India and China, for instance, the border was never defined. There was never a line. And ideas and people and trade moved in either direction. I mean, one gained from the other. Nobody dominated the other. But survey makes you draw lines. And when you draw lines, there is a border. And this side is mine, and that side is yours. And that's where I think you have to be very careful. <laughs> Nationalism itself is a construct of probably the 19th century. So today, everything is like an IPL match. Well, we did it, we won it. But life is not about winning matches. Life is about make, moving ahead, solving the problems of our country, and there are many problems. So I'm glad that we have institutions like the Indian Army, which provide a level of discipline, a level of focus, apart from the fact that it's obviously a great career to which, at least on this side, uh, you have many, many distinguished people. But you have to see this within a wider framework. And that, and I, and I like to thank Shoboto for this, for bringing this whole um, the, the Brains Trust together in the UK High Commission, because you, you provided a platform. I mean, you're here today. I didn't know a lot of what was spoken today. I mean, I've known it over the last year or year and a half. But there's too much about ourselves, about our country, about the issues that we don't know. So my, my hunch is that we would be better off talking uh, rather than talking to each other rather than confronting each other. That brings us last question. I just want to thank you. Uh, it's been fantastic. And thank you, Ravi, Sri Ram. And Hema, I'm glad you've come. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we have got about, I think right now we've got about 45 odd uh, videos up uh, on various subjects, 23, 25 speakers. The next season is coming up. If you find someone who's got a good story to tell, which we want to put together, we'd be very happy. We are doing one on uh, Ramanujam and Professor Hardy in Cambridge. I think it's a fascinating story and on Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan and his Hibbert Memorial Lectures in Cambridge. So, and what happens now is that the group will travel to different cities like we have met today and meet people like you and uh, we'll sort of put together what we have done so that more and more people get to sort of, uh, you know, engage as it were, that's one. But if you want to see it, it's available, it's all free to air and that work will carry on. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Man.